I'm delighted to be here, and I'm also happy to be reminded what year it was I was elected a member of this society. It was at a time when Mary and Richard Dunn were, uh, who many of you um, knew and loved, were presiding over this society, and it was a real thrill um, to be invited into this company. And I'm very happy to be here today as well. I'm trained in early American history. I've written a great deal about the col colonial America, about the American Revolution. I've inched my way up into the 19th century working on a history of textile production. And in my most recent book, I made it all the way to 1870. <laughs> now, I'm going to take a real departure today by flashing forward almost 50 years and talking a bit about um, an artifact, um, a cartoon, that I want to share with you that comes from 1915. Not quite into the era when I was born, but into my mother's era. So um, I, I encountered this as I was trying to do some work at the Museum of the American Revolution, and we were talking about, is there a way in which early Americanists and a Museum of the American Revolution could do something in honor of the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920. And I came up with a brilliant idea. I said, let's work on the iconography of the American Revolution, and in particular, on the icon of liberty, the goddess of liberty and then explore how that changed over time from the mid-1700s to 1920. The committee rejected my idea. <laughs> and so I felt like I really needed to explore it a bit on my own and find out what there was to discover. And what I'm going to share with you today is just one little piece of that exploration, beginning with uh, the illustration, the cartoon that you have before you. As you see, it was done um, for a humor magazine, Puck, published in 1915. The cartoonist, Hi Mayer, was born in Germany, came to the United States, and became quite a popular illustrator in the early 20th century. So who do we have? What do we see in this cartoon? Obviously, we see a giant figure striding across a map of the United States. And on her flowing cape, are the words, woman suffrage. So what's she up to? What is she doing? And what is the iconography? And what does it represent? Well, I think the first thing most of us would notice is probably the torch. So um, pretty obvious. Not hard to figure that one out. Um, she is the goddess of liberty. She's dressed in flowing robes as the Statue of Liberty, which, which was dedicated um, many years before, but had become a really powerful icon by this period. So we have the goddess of liberty with her flaming torch of freedom and welcome striding across the map of the nation. The really noticeable thing, though, the contrast between the drawing and the statue is she's not perched on her pedestal. She's in motion. And in that sense, 
and in the decolletage of her clothing, uh, she, I think, reminds me, and it may remind you as well, to that icon of the American Revolution, liberty leading the people, painted by Delacroix in 1830. And it's a reminder of the multiplicity of the concept of liberty that came from radical Whig politics in England into Boston in the 1760s, ended up in engravings by Paul Revere, was a central image all through the revolutionary period in the United States and after, went to France, went to Haiti, went elsewhere. A revolutionary image, a woman on a pedestal welcoming people to this nation. And both of them are reflected in some sense in this image. But I wondered as I looked at it, if there might even be something almost personal in the drawing. I don't know what you think, but I, you know, this is probably a kind of standard hairstyle for 1915, but she does look a little bit like Alice Paul, who had received a lot of attention in 1913 for organizing a massive women's suffrage parade, and by 1915 had organized a new suffrage movement that had pushed back from the presumably stodgy old ladies that had got the movement going, were doing things that were more disruptive, more out there, campaigning in automobiles, massive parades, and eventually, as some of you know, demonstrating in the front of the, heist, in the White House in an act of civil disobedience that ended up in jail, being force-fed, as had their mentors in England shortly before. Some of this new kind of energy is represented in the cover illustration for the, the massive parade in Washington in 1913, and that parade was led by a Joan of Arc kind of figure on a, on a white horse, um, Ines Mulholland. And it was one of the largest demonstrations ever, um, even to this day, in um, going, parading down the mall, and when the parade reached the Treasury Building, a whole pageant unfolded on the steps of the building with Liberty coming out with a train of ch little children with pastel-colored balloons and dancing barefoot to indicate this new kind of energy, this new kind of liberty in the fight for the vote. Well, yeah. This all makes quite a bit of sense to me. But the thing that's most interesting to me about this cartoon is the geography. The cartoon is labeled The Awakening. Who is being awakened and how? You see on the eastern side of the US map a great many women who appear to be caught in a tar pit of some kind. They're reaching up in a plaintive way toward the goddess. And what has happened in this image is quite dramatic. Progress and awakening are moving from west to east, rather than in the iconic American and in, indeed European Western story, progress moving from east to west, the transit of civilization going from east to west. 
And we have here in this 1872 railroad <laughs> illustration by John Gast, um, the image of America <laughs> stringing telegraph wire <laughs> literally across the western landscape. You can see the Rocky Mountains in the distance. You can see the disappearing Indians going before her as the stagecoach and eventually the railroad comes to bring civilization from east to west. So how did this happen? <laughs> How did we get this cartoon that turns this classic understanding of the geographic configuration of the United States backwards? And I have to tell you that I've shown this cartoon to an, a number of groups, including some, some very sophisticated people. And initially, they look at it and they just don't get it because it's so embedded to think of the West as out there, out there somewhere, um, and that new ideas and progress emanated in the, in the long history of the United States from East to West. So where is this enlightenment coming from? If we look very closely at the map, it's coming from some pretty surprising places. And trying to dig into this a little bit and to connect the map with the history of the women's suffrage movement helps us to understand something about the geograph geography of historical change that is seldom noted and I think quite important. Generally speaking, when we talk about the women's rights movement, people talk about the Seneca Falls Convention of 1848 in upstate New York. They think about Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony and then Lucy Stone and Henry Blackwell and others who got this women's rights going before the Civil War. And we think of it as pretty much emanating from those directions. But if we look now from the vantage point of 1915, when this drawing was created, no one east of this configuration of states had the right, no woman, had the right to vote. A few states by 1915 had passed state suffrage legislation or amendments. And there have been quite a rash of successes fairly recently from 1910 to 1914. Part of that awakening that I talked about earlier with the parades and the new energy coming into the movement. So we have Washington, Montana, Oregon, Nevada, California, Arizona, Kansas. Really pivotal moment in the suffrage movement where for a very long time, and if you think of this being proposed in 1848 and then again in 1869, and, and then you think of how long that struggle had been. And if we go back to look at the other states, look where they are. Huh, you might think California, but do you really think Wyoming, my home state of Idaho, Colorado, can that be Utah? My goodness. And if we go back earlier to the territorial period, Wyoming loves to call itself the equality state, tiny little Wyoming the first in the nation to give women the right to vote. And about three weeks after the 
Wyoming legislature, and I think there were about eight men in that legislature. There were 9,000 people in Wyoming in 1869. They had barely achieved territorial status. But they wrote women's suffrage into their founding document. And three weeks later, in the territory of Utah, Utah women got the vote. And in Utah, there were 90,000 people. In Wyoming, there had been six men to every woman at that time, and a lot of joking about, we pass women's suffrage, we might get some women to come to Wyoming. <laughs> But what on earth was going on in Utah in 1870? Where the heck is Utah? <laughs> Just in case you don't know. <laughs> I'm a graduate of the University of Utah. <laughs> so I always have to give a little shout out here. Um, <clears throat> but I want you to look very closely at that map. This is a wonderful um, demographic display done in 1870 by Frances Walker, the head of the US Census at the time, showing through the shading in the gray to black the population density of the United States in 1870. The patches of yellow are presumably where the American Indians are supposed to be, supposed to be. As we know, the Plains Indian Wars are not yet ended. And if you look there and try to find Utah in this map of population density, you will see it. There's a very dark patch right around the area of the Great Salt Lake, and then a long line stretching down to the Arizona border. And what we are looking at there is a population growth, territorial expansion, and economic development that has taken place over about 22 years. The Latter-day Saints, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, known commonly as Mormons, had come to Utah as refugees. They literally were thrown out of the United States in 1846. They were able to stay briefly on Indian lands near Omaha, Nebraska, until they were able to get the wherewithal to go to what they thought was Mexican territory. Fortunately, by the time they really got there, the Mexican War had made Utah part of the new acquisition of the United States. And so it had been a kind of rough time not only settling that community. They brought about 69,000 converts by wagon train and handcart to Utah by the time the railroad was completed in 1869. That's just the year before women got the vote in Utah. And why and how did they get the vote? They got the vote because Latter-day Saints legalized polygamy or plural marriage in the territory of Utah. And there were certain folks in the United States who were trying very, very hard to change that. Uh, by law. The first laws were passed in 1861, but Abraham Lincoln declined to enforce it because he was a little bit busy dealing with the Civil War. But after the Civil War, Congress decided they needed to rid the United States of what they, the Republican Party had defined in the 18. 56 First Convention as the twin relics of barbarism, slavery in the South, and polygamy in the territory of Utah. 
So the House of Representatives passed a law toward the end of 1869, which would have imprisoned male polygamists, forced wives to testify against their husband, and, and sign the church and outlaw that form of marriage and delegitimize de any children born under the system of what the Mormons called plural marriage. And to the astonishment of the nation, the Latter-day Saint women who were well organized in um, voluntary and charitable and self-help society called the Female Relief Society organized a massive indignation meeting, massed about 4,000 women into the largest building in Salt Lake City, forbade any man to enter the building unless he was a reporter. <laughs> and they got the results. It was published nationally. And they stood up and said, hey, you're going to imprison our husbands. You need to build the prisons large enough to keep us too, because where they go, we will go also. They also sent a resolution to the territorial legislature asking for the vote, and they elected some delegates, female delegates, to go to con Congress and represent them. They didn't have to go to Congress because the Senate didn't pass the Cohen Bill. And so there was a brief reprieve and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony came calling. The railroad had been completed. The leaders of the women's suffrage movement came to Utah in 1871. Met with the Mormon women, were totally skeptical of polygamy. Didn't, just thought they could just talk these women out of it. Um, and then they went home. But the women were not talked out of it. And in 1872, they founded what became the first women's rights newspaper published west of the Mississippi and the second longest published women's rights newspaper in the 19th century. They eventually formed very strong relationship with the National Women's Suffrage Association, which was the branch of the association led by Stanton and Anthony. People asked Anthony what she thought about polygamy. And she said, polygamy is no worse than monogamy. <laughs> Marriage is the problem. <laughs> Women will be slaves until they are no longer depend on men for bread. So she's talking about economic autonomy. The Female Relief Society um, was very engaged in developing cooperative economic enterprises and chair as well as charitable economic enterprises in their society. They certainly weren't. Um, divested from the control of men. It was a patriarchal society, as were others in the 19th century, but they had some liberties that other American women did not, including very liberal access to divorce, which included support for children and the ability to own their own property. It was a religious principle for them. Many of them had come as converts from wide-ranging parts of the United States and from Northern Europe, and they treasured religious liberty and communitarianism and were pushing back against what they feared, they and, and the male leaders as well, the community feared, the encroachment of European, of American capitalism railroads and mining, and that was coming very close at this point. So 
This movement continued, um, and so did the opposition continue. Saturday, on 1869, two, the, Emmeline B. Wells, who was editor of the Woman's Exponent, was on a train going to Washington, D.C. to attend the National Women's Suffrage Association Convention. And while on the train, they received word that the Supreme Court had responded to a suit initiated by the Latter-day Saint Church, challenging increasingly stringent efforts by Congress to what they consider deny them the, the right to practice their religion, which gave them the option under their religious system of plural marriage. And in the Reynolds decision of 1869, which was an extremely important Supreme Court decision, Congress gave the, um, the Supreme Court gave them the power um, to enforce anti-polygamy laws, which was the beginning of a, a really powerful effort to suppress not just the practice of polygamy, but the Latter-day Saint communities in Utah. And to give you some idea of what that was like and why I think this is an important story. I hope you can see that. This is another cartoon published in San Francisco in 1881. And it also has the figure of Columbia, a version of Lady Liberty. America is a distraught woman with three troublesome children. Uncle Sam is not being very helpful. He's very involved in politics and looking out the window at the U.S. Capitol, while Columbia is struggling with these three troublesome children who are polygamous Mormon, Chinese immigrant, and American Indian. And the rental decision, based on work by Francis Lieber, who was the first chair of social science, sociology at, the, at Columbia University, argued that the foundation, monogamy was the foundation of all Western civilization, and that the la only people who still allowed the practice of polygamy were the indolent Asians, the savage American Indians, the ignorant African, and the Latter-day Saints. Well, suffragists weren't very popular in the 19th century. Stanton and Anthony were disreputable, but their Latter-day Saint allies were even less reputable in this period. And so quickly, I'm having a little trouble, something with, okay. Just to quickly how this comes together politically. In 1882, Congress published the Edmonds Act, which fined male polygamists, imprisoned many of them, and disenfranchised all men who practiced polygamy. Six weeks later, the same Congress, with the same sponsors, were able to pass the Chinese Exclusion Act, which made immigration of Chinese laborers um, cease and naturalization of those already here forbidden. When that failed to solve the problem in Utah, they passed the Edmunds-Tucker Act, 
which confiscated all church property, including sacred temples, and disenfranchised women. They had been voting for 17 years, and they were disenfranchised. So they had to win the right to vote again, and they did, in part with the help of the National Women's Suffrage Association. The church in 1890 disavowed polygamy. There would have been no church, no community otherwise. And then these women went to work to convince their Mormon men now um, to reinstate the original. And it went to a referendum, not just to the legislature. And it passed resoundingly. So in 1895, the Utah Territory became the third state, now a state, now statehood passed, the third state in the nation to pass women's suffrage. And a polygamous wife who was a trained physician trained at the University of Michigan and with postgraduate work at the University of Pennsylvania, decided to run for the state senate. And Martha Hughes Cannon became the first woman in the United States to serve in a state senate. What is the lesson? Well, I think the most important lesson here and something we need to think about a lot as we go into a new political era where women's voices really appear to be <laughs> rising. But the important lesson that I take from this is that there are many kinds of women. Women of different races, women of different religions, women of different geographies, education, and areas. And the Utah situation tells us what happens when the interests of the men in their community and the interests in the women in their community came together and when they could support each other in achieving or not achieving but fighting for their religious liberty and their political liberty. Thank you. Yeah, well, well. I have a question, I'm not sure. One question. Oh, yeah. question. Just one okay. question, I'm afraid. One question, okay. I think we have maybe time for just one question. Mm -hmm. But he has one. If not, then... Uh, Oh. Michael Silverstein. Uh, Michael Silverstein. Um, I was fascinated that the cartoon is dated 1915. World War I was on in Europe. 1915. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, uh, 1915. Um, yes. It, World War I was on in Europe, and there was a, an extraordinarily, uh, extraordinarily um, massive sensitivity in this country um, uh, about um, the nature of liberty and democracy and so on and so forth. John Dewey was on his high horse at that time, right. denouncing the Germans yes. um, uh, philosophically, as, as it were, right. and so on and so forth. So, and, and, and also, the cartoonist obviously was a German Jew who, yes. who, 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 who named Chaim, no doubt. That's yes. why. Hi. So, all of this is extraordinarily interesting as a backdrop. Um, that, that, that in a certain sense really does say that it's a different era from the, from the era of the um, 1860s and 70s that you're talking about in terms of domestic uh, liberty, as it were. Um, somewhat. <laughs> we, we'd also began, began to severely limit European immigration. I mean, it's an ongoing, an ongoing story. The World War um, the participation of women and the U.S. Partic participation in World War I was very brief, as you know. 
but there was a massive effort to get women to participate in various ways. And some people feel, feel that had made some contribution to the passage of suffrage. Maybe more important was they passed the 18th, 17th and 18th Amendments, I mean, prohibition, which didn't work out so well, took away the problem of the liquor interests, which had been such an issue on the East Coast because they feared women's suffrage. But I think the more important thing is in that period um, just prior to the 19th Amendment, Americans were thinking about changing their constitution. So direct election of senators, for example, was extremely important, and as you say, a movement and a focus, a new focus on democracy. There are a hundred explanations on the women's suffrage question, and there'll be some wonderful new books coming out that will help us on this. But the key point is there, that there had to be coalitions and there were multiple issues in every state that helped to create what did and did not happen. It's amazing to me that Stanton and Anthony embraced the women of Utah. They didn't have to do that. More conservative suffragists did not. It probably hurt them because they're still talking about, oh, Suffrage is something those awful Mormons adopted as late as, 18, as 1915. But they did it, which was very, very interesting. And when Susan B. Anthony died, she took a, one of her gold rings from her finger and had it sent to the editor of, of the Utah Women's Exponent. So something mysterious happened in that relationship that's very interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you.